Okay, well, welcome everyone. Feel free to come and have a seat over here. We're gonna go ahead and get started here momentarily. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Samantha Gill and I'm the Public Services Manager here at the Hayes Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know there's a ton going on and I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to join us for our second event in the Sorting Out Race series. Uh, today we are pleased to welcome Ann Dean for a presentation on the power of imagery and the civil rights experience. Our program is brought to us by Humanity Kansas, an independent nonprofit leading a movement of ideas to empower the people of Kansas to strengthen their communities in our democracy. Um, please take a moment to silence your cell phones. This will be recorded tonight. Anne is an artist and a freelance photographer who also teaches photography at the Lawrence Art Center. So without further ado, please welcome Anne Dean. All right. Thank you, Anne. Hello, everybody. Thanks for being here. I appreciate y'all coming. Do you mind if I do a selfie with you really oh, quick? Yeah, I've never sure. done this, and I always I'm like, I forgot my selfie. Okay, let's see. Okay, here we go. Uno, dos, tres. Okay. Thanks, everybody. All right, I'm going to get this to my old man so he can take some pictures. Um, thank you so much, Samantha and the Hayes Library, for having me. Um, this has been just a, a really great uh, thing going around to different libraries in Kansas and uh, I, I used to do uh, more talks about Gordon Parks but I'm doing this presentation for the 70th anniversary of the Brown versus Board of Education uh, uh, ruling and so Humanities Kansas which is a great organization if you don't know that much about it uh, you know, definitely check them out online. They have so much going on. Um, and it was a lot to tackle, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, but I think, I think we've come up with some good stuff. So um, I'm gonna chat a little bit about uh, the civil rights photographers. Um, we're going to um, delve into the impact of photography on the civil rights movement in the aftermath of, of the landmark Supreme Court case uh, decision, um, which really helped establish the precedent that separate but equal education as well as all other services weren't really equal, even though they were separate. Um, and so we'll begin by tracing the evolution of how African American individuals and communities have been portrayed from historical beginnings in this country. Uh, to the civil rights era. That's kind of like the beef of what we're talking about, the civil rights era photographers, and the real importance that imagery had on the movement. And then we're gonna move into the present day. Where are we now? Like, where we started, where are we now? So, um, kind of see how the culture has grown, where, where we've come uh, as, a, as a culture and as, as a United States people, right? Um, so, I invite any questions, comments uh, after the presentation. I'm interested to hear what you all think or um, you know, any ideas that you might have. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Everybody hear okay? Um, all right, so let's, let's begin, okay? Um, we'll start with this image. This is Margaret Burke White, the world's highest standard of living, and it's from the Louisville flood in 1937. So really since its inception, photography has been used for raising awareness of social issues, provoking emotions, provoking thoughts, and really reshaping our perceptions of how we see the world. And the great photographers really open your eyes to the world around you. Their images raise awareness, they make you feel emotion. All great photographs make you feel something, right? Might not make us all feel the same thing, but it, they evoke some kind of emotion in you. And imagery is really just a super powerful reminder of our history. It allows us to bear witness to our collective past, not just one group, but everybody. This is all of our past, right? It can also be used as a tool to help us gain a better understanding of each other, 
which is really important, especially today, right? Especially those who are different from us. Their documentation, these photographs, their proof. And some images can really speak for an entire era, like this one, okay? They demand that we take pause. They demand us looking inside ourselves and really considering what might be happening in the world around us that's outside of our bubble, okay? And perhaps some of the most powerful early photographs are of, are of activist, abolitionist, orator, and formerly enslaved man, Frederick Douglass, who escaped slavery in 1838. And that was the same year that Louis Daguerre took the first photograph of a person in Paris and the camera was unleashed to the world, right? And the medium of photography was born. So Frederick Douglass identified photography with freedom. He also understood the power of his words, rising from slavery, to become a man of growth, a man of self-mastery. He lectured on how black lives are honored and preserved through photography in his lecture on pictures. He also had another lecture called Pictures in Progress. So he was, he was headstrong into the photography movement from its inception, okay? Um, he recognized that it could be a very powerful tool. He talked about the daguerreotype, which we see here on this first photograph, talked about it being one of the central modern marvels of the day. He understood that representation itself could be an important mechanism for ending slavery and for achieving universal freedom and equality. The first image ever taken of him was this early daguerreotype, and he constantly sat for the camera to communicate to the world a serious, intelligent, engaged, good-looking, dignified man, right, that maybe the world hadn't seen before. And this made him the most photographed man of the 19th century, and he sat for about 160 photographic portraits throughout his life. And Frederick Douglass said, when you look at a photograph of me, you will never deny that I'm a man worthy of freedom and worthy of citizenship. You'll look me in the eye, you'll see my humanity. And in 1841, when he was asked about being an enslaved person, formerly, he would respond, what shall I say about this experience? I have seen the cruelty and the brutality of slavery, and I've been subjected to the depths of slave life. I was a graduate from this particular institution, very peculiar, and the diploma is written on my back. Frederick Douglass. So African descendant individuals were really seen as subhuman, as savages, and they were treated as such. This is called Escrava Anastasia, which roughly translates to Anastasia the Enslaved. It's an illustration by Jacques Etienne Victor Arago, made in 1839, which was made just one year after Douglas escaped human bondage. They were subject to really brutal conditions, labor, exploitation, and the denial of just basic human rights. And the life average, the life expectancy for enslaved Africans was just a shocking 21 years. Know that. Anastasia, she was unfathomably beautiful. Her story, she was forced to wear this heavy iron shackle around her neck and a muzzle on her face. I was really interested in this. I looked up the story and it was due to the jealousies of the women, mostly the white women around her demanding that she wear it because they didn't want their men to bear witness to her incredible beauty. And she died of tetanus caused by the collar. Before she passed, though, she did the unimaginable. Despite this inhumane treatment, she cured her master's child of a serious disease and pardoned them for the unforgivable treatment that she endured, proving that kindness and decency knows no bounds. Right? And when you have no control of your image, you have no control of your story, those in power can really label and depict you as anything they want if they choose to. Because what our elders teach us, or what they don't teach us, and what we see and hear throughout our lives, 
it's greatly gonna affect the way that we see others and affect the way that we can see entire groups of people, right? And the, the exhibit that the library has right now, amazing. It's one of the best that I've seen on this subject. It covers so much, so uh, I, I'm so happy to have been able to, to see that. So these inaccurate perceptions, they grew into really negative, ugly stereotypes. A lot that are seen over here, more that we'll see here. And these ended up impacting an entire race and also enabled these fa falsehoods to be taught, continued, and blindly carried on throughout generations. Blacks were vilified, demonized, twisted, ghoulish versions of themselves and turned into racist tropes like coons, pickaninnies, mammies, sambos, Uncle Toms. This is a restaurant sign in the South that was there for way too long, okay? These were caricatures with exaggerated features. They were mocked and dehumanized in drawings with awful captions and titles. Okay, the five jolly darkies way down in old Virginia. This was a target game that taught kids it was okay and really even fun to hurt black people. Here we see an early 1900s postcard. These were called coon cards back in the day, depicting African Americans doing all kinds of things, always looking sort of animalistic, happy to do nothing but eat watermelon and kind of another bid to dehumanize. Here's another coon card suggesting that even little black children may be inclined towards violent behavior. There was also many white actors and actresses in blackface, like famous white performers seen here, Burt Williams in 1904, and Tessa Gardella in blackface as Aunt Jemima in 1933. But of course, this is all a matter of perception versus reality, right? And as photography took off and came more accessible to everyone, and not just a luxury for the rich, which it was for quite some time, former enslaved people were really given a voice, and they could be seen for who they really are, dignified, fully realized human beings. And after gaining freedom, African Americans like this unidentified Union soldier sitting with his family began posing for formal portraits that reflected their idea of themselves rather than the ideas of those who had enslaved them, right? Giving you a little bit more power that you can take back. Photography brought a voice to the unheard, unseen, misunderstood, and just helped shape the overall view of who black Americans really were. And you know, I've been really fascinating, fascinated learning the mostly unknown stories of the 1800s black cowboys and also black cowgirls, which I didn't really know much about uh, before I started researching this topic, including of course the famous black cowboy of the American Frontier, Nat Love, or Nate Love, AKA Deadwood Dick, pictured here in his fighting clothes. Proud, right? Powerful. Very different than the caricatures that we saw. And in 1875, Oliver Lewis, who was a black man, became the first ever jockey to win the Kentucky Derby, which is America's longest standing continuous uh, sporting event. And he rode aboard the Colt Aristides that you can see pictured in the back. Beautiful photograph. These images of power and beauty, they continued well into the 20th century with artists like Duke Ellington, always making sure to portray a clean, sophisticated look, right? To be respected, to be revered, along with his musical prowess, of course. But the way you show yourself makes so much difference, especially back then, right? It was so important for African Americans to be seen as worthy citizens by white America, as complete human beings who could contribute to and add something positive to society, right? 
Picture it here, I had to include this picture. This is my mother and father around the same time as, as the Duke's picture. Uh, 1952, they're at SIU College in Illinois, Southern Illinois. We grew up in St. Louis. And uh, they believed strongly in looking their best and they're going to a college football game, right? Who goes to a college football game looking like this, right? I look younger than them uh, in their early 20s than, the, okay? So I look at this picture and you know, it's like it's taken from below my photographer brain and they just look so proud and so beautiful. And to my favorite picture of my parents back in 1952, um, and shortly after this photo was taken, they were married, they moved to St. Louis, and when they tried to purchase a home in an all-white neighborhood, uh, a petition was drawn up by the residents to keep them out. But they refused to back down, and they felt they had just as much right as anybody else to buy a house in their neighborhood. And, you know, my father had a good job. He was the chief of, director of microbiology at St. Louis City Hospital. And they bought their house, all right? They were like, no, we're going to go ahead and do that. How difficult, though, when you know nobody wants you. They went ahead and did it anyway. And we lived there until I graduated from high school. And many of those same neighbors lived there right beside us, and they became lifelong friends. And that's what it's all about, right? Understanding between people. And they met them, and they realized these are good people right here, regardless of race. And you know, the truth is we're all human beings and we all hope for many of the same things in life. Happiness, love, respect, decency, compassion, empathy. That's what we all crave down deep, right? And when we get to know each other, we get to see that, okay, we, we really do have a lot more in common than we thought we did. So just as, as Frederick Douglass recognized the power of photography as a tool to help put an end to slavery and injustice, the photographers during the civil rights era turned their cameras towards the fight for equality, the fight for human rights. I mean, pretty simple sign, huh? Their business was to expose the truth about the lives and the treatment of African Americans in the United States. And this is Ernest Withers' photograph of sanitation workers assembling in front of Claiborne Temple for a solidarity march in Memphis, Tennessee. This is 1968. And then once they assembled, they marched for justice that day at gunpoint. And this was, Ernest Withers was one of the few black photographers I could find from the civil rights era. There weren't many, but there were a few and, and they were very powerful and their, their photographs were, were different, you know, told a different story. But these photographers, they had to be brave, steadfast, determined to shed light on our behavior as a nation. And they took their jobs very seriously. They had integrity. They were respected in their communities. And they stood by a very strict code of conduct. They were non-biased. Non-biased. So hard to find that in photojournalism and news these days. You know, they, they use the power of the still images to expose these atrocities that were occurring. They were just trying to tell the truth, right? Trying to get something to be seen that was not seen. And these things were occurring on a daily basis, on a smaller scale than uh, these huge marches, you know. Um, but this one was, this is Spider Martin. He was a, was a huge, huge force in the civil rights uh, photography movement. And this is John Lewis in Selma, Alabama, March. Uh, he was beaten, he was bloodied, hospitalized after this. And you know, they had to put themselves in precarious, unsafe situations, and in areas that they didn't necessarily want these acts to be seen, right? This was happening, but it was kind of on the down low, especially in the South, for the most part, but the photographers, all of a sudden, here they are bringing it up to the top. Um, and that meant that these behaviors would be exposed to the rest of the country, much less to the rest of the world. So, you know, the people in these areas felt that the photographers were against them and weren't on their side, couldn't get with the program, you know, because like I said, what you're taught, you believe. So they didn't understand why this was so wrong, right? But it was, the job of the photographers as good photojournalists to document these events, 
to tell the truth, because these uh, acts would go unseen otherwise, and the horrible cycle of violence and discrimination would continue unchecked. And the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. Part of that vigilance comes from a visual way of understanding what we're experiencing. Like I said, photographers and, and images evoke so much emotion, right? What needs to be confronted? This is Matt Heron's image of a Mississippi highway patrolman arresting five-year-old Anthony Quinn during a voting rights protest when he refused to give up his small American flag. The patrolman pretty much went berserk, wrenched it out of his hands, and arrested the kid. This is Jackson, Mississippi, 1967. Okay. One of the most famous photographers of the era was a Kansan, our Gordon Parks, our native son. Born in Fort Scott, 1912, youngest of 15 kids in a family deeply affected by racial terror that was used to enforce Jim Crow segregation. He became the first black photographer for Life magazine, and he would really help give a voice to the underrepresented, to the marginalized black community in the United States. He pushed everybody. He stretched the idea of how African Americans were seen, especially to white America, because that's who was reading Life magazine. And they hadn't seen these types of images before, right? And in 1942, Mr. Parks would capture this iconic image. This is Ella Watson, a cleaning woman at his place of work in Washington, D.C. His first night on the job, mind you, he was just leaving, found her, took this picture, and it sat for years because his boss was like, you're going to get us all fired with this mm -hmm. stuff, right? So it sat for a long time, and, and it almost didn't get seen. Uh, but this became his version of American Gothic, which is based on the famous painting by Grant Wood of the farmer and his wife standing pitchfork in hand. Interesting juxtaposition and interesting that he would call it the same name. Uh, bold of him at the time. He also gave us this enduring portrait, Emerging Man. This was in 1952 and it was based on Ralph Ellison's book, uh, Invisible Man. Great book if you haven't read it. His exquisite portraits, isn't it beautiful? And as we look at these, each one of these pictures is going to make you feel something different. You're all going to maybe feel something a little different. But I love this photograph so much. Um, beautiful portraits of the African American experience that would show white America what it really was like to live as an African descendant in the United States. The joy at times, right? And, and also the struggles. He understood how to take the trauma behind institutionalized racism and convey that to the viewer with an evo evocative feeling. And this picture, great photograph. He was not afraid. The woman saw it, and this was the one thing she noticed. She said, I, I can't believe my bra strap was down. I'm so embarrassed. You know, that's because she, it was so important to look your best at all times, right? To look your best at all times. Gordon Park says, I live off my emotions, so I turn those emotions into some kind of mercenary thing in which I could survive and somehow even transcend my own experience. He was a pioneer, Gordon Parks. So he helped to inspire these civil rights photographers. Another one of his photographs of Malcolm X who Mr. Parks became the godfather of one of Malcolm X's daughters. I didn't know that. Um, and he would continue his work throughout the civil rights era and really for the rest of his, his life, although he did many, many things, um, he would always come back uh, to this type of photography. And as his memoir of the same title explains, he saw the camera as his choice of weapons, another great book, choice of weapons against all things he disliked about living in America as a black man. And the same echoes can be heard today. But in 1947, he photographed the doll tests for Ebony Magazine. If you haven't heard of him, the famous psychological test conducted over a period of 14 years 
by, um, by African American doctors, Kenneth and Mamie Clark, would present young black children with a white doll and a black doll. They were asked to identify which doll they preferred, which one was good and which one was bad. And most children chose the white doll. And when asked which doll was most like them, some children became upset when they had to identify with the black doll. Some even ran out of the room in tears, having fits. And the study did reveal that there was psychological damage caused by segregation and discrimination on African American children. Damage to their self-esteem, right? To their feeling deep down about themselves. And it caused them to develop a, a sense of inferiority. And it also helped to influence the Brown versus Board education decision that separate was not equal. And it demanded that racial integration of American public schools happen. And this really helped push the decision along. Here's Nettie Hunt with her daughter Nikki on the Supreme Court steps in 1954, just after the decision was passed down. And equal justice under the law is what's etched into the facade of the Supreme Court building. The decision was unanimous. It was handed down on May 17, 1954 that racial segregation in public schools was unconstitutional. And it was really one of the most significant court decisions in US history. But really for at least a decade or more after the ruling, it was met with very fierce resistance, especially in the South. And it reminds us today that the ideals of the US Constitution can never be really taken for granted. And that just because the court rules one way doesn't necessarily make it so, okay? Picture here, we see Dorothy Counts. This is 1957, photographer Douglas Martin. Um, and she's trying to integrate into her local high school. Of course, the famous Ruby Bridges walking through the doors of William France Elementary School in New Orleans. This is 1960, photographer unknown. And of course, James Meredith enrolling as the first black student at Ole Miss College, Oxford, Mississippi, 1962. Here he's escorted by U.S. Marshals. And this is photographed by Charles Moore that we'll talk more about in a minute. Uh, as we all know, probably violence erupted. And tragically, two innocent bystanders lost their lives. Over 200 marshals and soldiers were injured. 200 people were arrested. It was an absolute mess, okay? And pictured here is an effigy of James Meredith hanging from the neck and dangling outside the second story window of one of the men's dormitories on campus. And it really wouldn't be until 1969, 69, that all Mississippi schools were finally forced to integrate, forced to integrate, because they wouldn't do it. But now it was clear that the federal government would protect the rights of citizens from state laws that threaten those rights if they were tested. And they were tested again and again and again. But black Americans had enough and the civil rights movement had begun. This is 1957, iconic image of the American civil rights movement made by photographer Will Counts. He was born and raised in Little Rock, Little Rock, Arkansas. His photographs were made with the pain, pride, and shame that only a white Southerner could bring to the story of American civil rights. According to an NPR doc that I found on him, that's what, what they had to say about him. And the image shows black student Elizabeth Eckford, one of the Little Rock Nine, trying to enter her high school. She's surrounded by a white mob. And Hazel Bryan is who you see yelling at her from behind, her face really contorted with anger, the people with her unhappy. And this image has really become a notorious symbol of the movement, and it followed Eckford and Bryan throughout their lives. It later became well known simply as the scream image. But in 1963, Hazel Bryan had a change of heart. She tracked Elizabeth Eckford down and apologized for her behavior. Counts photographed the two of them once again in 97 for a poster. And underneath, uh, the caption of the poster says, 
True reconciliation can only occur when we honestly acknowledge our painful past, but shared past. And the two women did strike up a very unlikely friendship for a while. They spoke at schools about race and tolerance, but there were some strains to be expected, okay? Uh, and the friendship ended and uh, went downhill. But they tried, right? At least they tried and got a lot done during the time. Here we have Charles Moore, the photographer who photographed uh, uh, James Meredith down at Ole Miss. This is that day, that evening. You see he has a gas mask there, and he was knew that violence was going to break out. Charles Moore, one of the best known civil rights photographers, he was born in Hackleburg, Alabama, 1931, okay? And in Hackleburg, segregation was a way of life. He would see black Americans denied their civil rights for years, but Charles Moore's parents wouldn't allow this type of hatred. And the N-word was not to be used in their home. That's what he was taught. He credited them for giving him his strength, his faith, and his acceptance of all people. Charles Moore said, pictures can absolutely make a difference and have an impact on society. That's what photojournalism is. These images allow especially white Americans to see the violence and cruelty that black America must endure. Here we see the Alabama Fire Department aiming high pressure water hoses at peaceful demonstrators in Birmingham on May 3rd, 1963. And the protests in Birmingham, they, these were a turning point for the civil rights movement. And Moore really captured the sheer terror, meeting a nonviolent demonstration with pretty fierce aggression and brutality because the power of these fire hoses could rip the skin off your body, leave you bruised, bloodied, battered. It was intense, okay? They also turned their police dogs on the protesters who could certainly inflict damage if they were commanded to do so, right? That's what they're trained to do, so. Charles Moore said, they seemed to enjoy beating on these people. They had such hatred in their faces as they committed these atrocities and spewed out their anger and their venom. And the photographers were really easy targets because they had their cameras and they were harassed endlessly. Moore said he would get taunted, yelled at, cursed out, have things thrown at him. He and the others would be followed in their cars and they would speed up behind them, hitting the bumper and threatening them. But there's really no room for this type of behavior in a free society that we live in. So not only the photographers, but the demonstrators refused to give up. They refused to yield, just as, as the subjects they, they were photographing refused to yield. And they were really determined to tell their stories, to stand up for justice no matter the cost. And it took a lot of patience and a lot of stamina to be a civil rights photographer, but they were aggressive. And Charles Moore was very aggressive in his work, but he could be empathetic at the same time. His hope was that the images would be stark reminders of this hatred and could help free ourselves as a society. And his photographs allowed folks to see for themselves what was happening in the country and not just depend on word of mouth. Okay? Make up your own mind about what you feel is right and what you feel is wrong. The photos show us that the rights of all human beings must be respected and not taken for granted. And his images are definitely credited with helping to quicken the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. So Charles Moore was a major player in the civil rights movement. Tough to look at, I know. And a picture really is worth a thousand words. It rings true very loudly here when we look at these two images taken almost a century apart. And the brutality started from the very beginning. African people stolen away from their homelands, packed into ships like sardines, taken across the world to another continent if they survived the pitiful conditions of the journey. 
that is. And when they arrived, they were treated like animals. They were branded, they were shackled, whipped, beaten into submission, stripped of their clothing, their dignity, their names, their families, their countries, their identities, all of it, and traded and sold into human servitude as property. And really the sheer trauma of this condition is unimaginable, and I'm kind of feeling a little verklempt just looking at it and thinking about it, but it happened right here in the United States, and it really wasn't so long ago if you think about the whole of history, okay? And so here we see Peter. He's also known as Gordon. He escaped from bondage in 1960, sorry, 1863. He endured a harrowing 10-day journey while barefoot, being chased by bloodhounds, being pursued for miles, and he found safety among Union soldiers encamped at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. When he was examined by the military doctors there, there discovered his horrific scars on his back from being savagely beaten over and over by the overseer on the plantation where he was enslaved. So they asked photographers McPherson and Oliver from Matthew Brady's studio to photograph him, to photograph his back. This image became known as Whipped Peter, and it created a sensation when it reached the public back then, and became one of the most powerful proofs of the brutality of the transatlantic slave trade. It also helped to raise a national outcry. It fueled the fires of abolition during the Civil War. Photography as proof, right? Imagery as a tool, okay? Peter would go on to fight for the Union Army, which I thought was amazing. So you fast forward to 1965. Here's another one of James Spider Martin's images. And the one he's captured here was that the Selma Voting Rights March. And this unidentified man is clearly fed up. He has his message of utter frustration written across his back. And this juxtaposed with the message beaten into Peter's back is a lot to take in, okay? And this was a bold comment that this man is expressing and displaying in a very dangerous environment where he could easily become a target for violence, right? But he was a defiant, he was unafraid, he was over it. <laughs> and he knew that his message had to be heard. He showed no fear in the face of such intense hatred and discrimination. Here's some more of Spider's images from that day. This is what this man was up against. Okay. And Spider Martin probably compiled the largest collection of photographs from the civil rights era. And Martin Luther King once said to him, Spider, we could have marched and protested forever, but it weren't, if it weren't for guys like you, it would have been for nothing. The whole world saw your pictures, and that is why the Voting Rights Act actually passed. Pictures as proof, pictures as power, okay? Here we see a 105-year-old former slave registering to vote for the first time in Greenville, Mississippi. A powerful moment, to say the least. They didn't give her name, but I just had to include this picture. Bob Gommel, photographer Bob Gommel, he worked for Life Magazine as well. Um, and he was really known for his iconic images of world leaders and popular culture. So he took this image of Malcolm X photographing Cassius Clay on fight night in Miami. And this was in 1964. Gommel said, the atmosphere was celebratory and jubilant. And it was very easy to be around these men and to capture their true essence. Both men would take great care to carefully craft their public images, very different public images, but they took great care in that, assuring that they were taken seriously. Even Ali assured that he was taken seriously, even though he had the two sides to himself, right? And they knew that controlling the narrative was a source of power for black people, just as Frederick Douglass had done years before. And seeing these two men who were really known to be kind of 
intimidating and fierce figures, letting their guards down, smiling, laughing together with their brothers, it makes us feel good. It makes me feel good anyway, right? It's unexpected, and it really gives us a much-needed sense of levity in the toughest of situations and the toughest of subjects. And I love how nobody's looking at, well, there's one guy looking at the photographer, there's always one looking. <laughs> but I love how they were just able to tune him out and but I mean, who wouldn't be looking at Malcolm X and Ali, but this is the kind of photography I like to do where you're just a fly on the wall in a place where such a powerful uh, moment is going on. And underneath it all, there somehow always seemed to be this sense of joy and positivity throughout the African American culture that was infectious and that couldn't be snuffed out. The site that we see here, a diner lunch counter, itself a symbol of resistance, was certainly no accident that this is where they decided to be. And Bob Gommel knew that. He knew how powerful that moment was going to be. And in hindsight, seeing where their two trajectories would take them in life was really astonishing. Because this was when he was still called Cassius Clay, right? Um, and really seeing the marks that each one of them made on, on our history as a country and, and in the world, really undeniable, right? Here we see a Gordon Parks image of Cassius Clay, who would change his name later that same year to Muhammad Ali, which filled him with great pride and great power, source of power for him, taken in 66. And tragically, uh, Malcolm X would be assassinated early the following year after that diner photograph was taken. And I think this is one of my very favorite photographs of Malcolm X, photographed by Eve Arnold, one of the other, only other female photographers I could find from back then, besides Margaret Burke White, who started us, us off. I love Eve Arnold. Check out her work if you can. This is Malcolm X in 1960. Kind of a crop version of the photo, but but beautiful nonetheless. So, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, right? The old, the old adage. And real progress would feel like one step forward, two steps back. And pictured here, we see the Newark, New Jersey riots. This is the summer of 1967. This was captured by Don Hogan Charles, which was the other African-American civil rights photographer that I was able to find. At first, everything said photographer unidentified for this picture, but I dug and dug and I finally accidentally found the photographer's name. Um, and it depicts the rioting in Newark by residents following the arrest of a black cab driver by two Newark policemen, which resulted in some injuries, some major injuries inflicted by the police. There was rioting, people were angry, they had had enough. This was 1967, so let's compare that to this image. This is Devin Allen, riveting Time magazine cover during the heated protests in Baltimore after the death of Freddie Gray due to police brutality, and that's almost 50 years later, right? 1968 crossed out, 2015 written in instead. And so the struggle for civil rights continues. And Freddie Gray, or uh, 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 Devin Allen, unknown before this. He was like a struggling photographer, but he knew he wanted to tell some stories, and this was the first real big photojournalism job that he had. Cover of Time Magazine. I'm like, wow, how do you do that? Okay. Um, right place, right time. Timing is everything. And to, for a photographer to put themselves in this position, that's, that's a weird, tough position dangerous to be in. So you have to have a certain amount of, uh, of you know, boldness to be this type of photographer, right? And you know, the death of Freddie Gray was, was a big deal um, due to police brutality. Same things going on almost 50 years later. Um, and the same issues at the forefront, right? Poverty, equal education, housing, voting rights, unemployment. So now we're still at that tipping point. 
How can we be? Well, here we are. We're, we're, we're still there. You know, the more things change, the more they stay the same. And today, a new generation of civil rights photographers are standing on the shoulders of trailblazers like Frederick Douglass and Gordon Parks and Charles Moore and Spider Martin, right? Including Devin Allen. His work is, is really bold and amazing. We also have Carrie Mae Weems, right? A very different feel to her images, beautiful images. We have Sheila Pre Bright, many more females entering the arena uh, of photography, right? Latoya Ruby Frazier. These are a couple of images from her. I can't imagine having my camera that close in that type of situation. I mean, it really, you have to, you have to be a certain type of person to, to be doing this, right? This is Daywood Bay. I'm sorry, this is, the last was Patience Salonga. I'm sorry, these are Patience Salonga. And this is Latoya Ruby Frazier, who is very uh, in the Gordon Park School of Photography. Lighting-wise, um, this reminds me so much of a Gordon Parks image, and I love to see him uh, pushing through in the photographers uh, of today. This is Daywood Bay. These are the types of images I, I like to take, a little more quiet, but still powerful, nonetheless, right? My mother-in-law introduced me to this photographer. She was, what do you call it, not a bosun, but a, at, a, at one of the museums in Kansas City, and he had an exhibit there, giant, you know, portraits. So she sent me a book of his, his work, Daywood Bay. And there's many others who continue the work of showing us the struggle for equality, and they're trying to really make sure that the lives of folks like George Floyd, like Breonna Taylor, like Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, who was from St. Louis, which is where I'm from, and that occurred not very far from where I grew up. Freddie Gray, and so, so, so many others. I saw some news program where they had the list of police brutality deaths among especially black men, but black women too, and I was just horrified. I couldn't believe it. But we say their names and we make sure that their lives weren't taken in vain, that their names are remembered, that their faces are seen. We need these images. We need this imagery. We need these voices. Okay, we can't brush it under, under the rug, can't do it. You know, the constant struggle had, oh, Eric Garner, sorry, in New York, Eric Garner. And, and the struggle is real, and it's been met with unrelenting resistance. We understand that, yet the refusal to give up or yield is there, because ignoring the situation or pretending like it never happened is not going to solve any of our problems, it's not gonna make it go away. But through photography, through imagery, we can relive these incidents from so long ago. We can see whipped Peter from the 1800s and think, wow, look at how imagery started and where it's come today, the, the, the journey that it's taken to give us a mirror of ourselves, to make us feel these emotions. This is another Ernest Withers shot they show us that this is all our burden as Americans. United states, right? United we stand, divided we fall. It, it is exhausting, I get that. It's tough, it's hard, it's difficult, but we talk about it because talking about it with each other makes us understand where, where each other's coming from a little bit more, you know? It's okay to be different and it's okay to think different. But it is important to, to know truths and to see history for what it really is, you know. Um, it's exhausting, it's draining, but at the same time it's triumphant and, it, and it's a success story. So we, we just push on and do what we have to do. And of course it's not just an African-American thing, it's all our thing, 
everybody who's here. And what did they call us, a melting pot? That's what we've always been known as, so let it be in a positive way, right? Let it be in a positive way. This is a wide angle view during the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. I never really knew that was the whole title of the March on Washington, but it was the March on Washington for jobs and freedom. This occurred on August 28, 1963, and courtesy of the National Archives, there was no photographer credited, but wow, it really gives you a sense of how important this was in the reflecting pool. A lot to reflect on here. So where are we today, you know, keep, keep going. And really Amer African American culture was once sort of thought to be off limits, frowned upon, socially deviant. It's now really being embraced and revered and finding its place in pop culture, especially within the arts, okay? Playing this really pivotal, undeniable role in shaping, influencing, and defining various aspects of mainstream culture today, contributing to trends, styles, expressions that have really resonated globally. Um, and this is Bisa Butler's Broom Jumpers. It's made in 2019 of quilted and applique cotton, wool, and chiffon. I just thought this was such a beautiful, vivid, colorful piece after seeing all the black and white imageries. I just stumbled upon this and thought, wow, you know, this is making me feel I, I want to include this. And really, you know, when we're talking about influence of the culture, everything from like language, some of this stuff I don't even know what that, those mean, but, and this was the only like real image I could find about it, but, but you know, you think of, of, of words and language like cool, hip, bro, dope, right? Uh, uh, kick it, turn up, extra. Yes, I don't know what get the bag or well, no cat means, but I looked him up and I still don't know what it means. Um, <laughs> but, but it was funny and, and I thought, wow, it, it really is funny how, how this language has found its way into to such mainstream culture. Definitely sports, right? The great Michael Jordan, the Williams sisters, I mean tennis, took a, took a lot to break down the walls of, of tennis the great Arthur Ashe, sort of leading the way, uh, among others, with that. Certainly music and fashion, right? Inventing new genres of music, the great Miles Davis uh, and the jazz era, right? It was invented in the United States, jazz, by African Americans. And what was his, the birth of the cool, <laughs> right? And like, who's cooler than, than Miles Davis, right? Uh, Gospel, rhythm and blues, soul and funk. James Brown, even with his conked out hair, he was still laying down the soul. He stopped doing that after a while and went to the Afro, but then he went back to it, you know? But I mean, we've gotta give, we've gotta give James his due. Diana Ross, right? Gospel, rhythm and blues, soul, funk. Prince Rogers Nelson, Beyonce the Queen, sliding into different genres even as we speak today. <laughs> hip hop, right? Hip hop was created here, Public Enemy, Chuck D and Flavor Flav and the rest of the crew, Tupac Shakur, gorgeous image. I could not not include that because I just love this image so, so much. Snoop, right? Now he's Ambassador Snoop at the Olympics for our country. I mean, we've come a long way, baby, you know what I mean? That's, Amazing to, to see uh, Ambassador Snoop. Even legendary actors, right? Like the great James Earl Jones, who just passed this week, and seeing this image with Darth Vader on the Empire State Building, obviously. <laughs> the Empire, Darth Vader, and, and then James Earl Jones as the voice of, of Darth Vader. Uh, a far cry from the days of blackface, right? And I mean, his voice is etched into our minds forever and ever and ever as the greatest villain of all times, Darth Vader, you know? And Darth Vader, you know, he, he got through his struggles and came out on the other side, you know? Powerful business, pioneers, world leaders, and we're still talking about it today, right? 
Who knows what's going to happen? We're 50-50, but, but interesting to see uh, where we started and where we are today. So I'm going to leave you with this. Okay? This is Daryl Davis, a black blues musician who he had played with such giants as Chuck Berry, B.B. King, Muddy Waters. But Daryl Davis was on a mission, and he went out of his way to befriend Ku Klux Klan Grand Dragon Roger Kelly. And he spent years building trust with Roger Kelly. They broke bread at each other's tables. They not only talked to each other, but they listened to each other as they did this. It took a lot for both men, I'm sure, to be able to do this, but music is, is the, the great bringer together of us, right? It's hard when you have music in common to not just really understand each other a little bit better right away. Um, and the two eventually realized they had far more in common than they thought. And in the end, Kelly denounced his ties to the Klan, Grand Dragon of the Klan, or whatever they call him, Grand Dragon, uh, and handed over his hood and robe to Daryl Davis. Just say, he's not B.B. King, he's not Muddy Waters, he's a musician, great musician, Daryl Davis, but nobody really knew his name. He was just a man on a mission. And since then, he's collected over 200 robes and hoods meeting extreme bias with civility, replacing hate with love, promoting understanding with each other. That causes us to look at ourselves and realize how ridiculous it all really is when we really think about it, okay? So do we really want to continue spending our energies fighting one another? Why, why do we want to do that? So what I think is don't be afraid to be curious. Don't be afraid to have a conversation to expand your horizons no matter how hard it might seem at first, right? I mean, if, if they can get through it, all of us certainly can because love conquers hate every time. And diversity does enrich all our lives for the better in ways that we could never imagine, okay? Thank you so much for being here, for listening, for looking.